The second U.S. presidential debate, which took place on October 22nd, 2020, was dominated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Democratic candidate Joe Biden excoriated Donald Trump's response to the disease in an unanswerable indictment of the sitting president. 220,000 Americans dead. If you hear nothing else I say tonight, hear this. Anyone who is responsible for that many deaths should not remain as president of the United States of America. There are over 70,000 new cases per day, Biden said. He continued, the fact is that when we knew it was coming, when it hit, what happened? What did the president say? He said, don't worry, it's going to go away. It'll be gone by Easter. Don't worry. Warm weather. Don't worry. Biden went on. Trump says we're learning to live with it. People are learning to die with it. To this damning condemnation by Biden, Trump had only one response. It's not my fault that it came here. It was China's fault. And you know what? It's not Joe's fault that it came here either. It's China's fault. They kept it from going into the rest of China for the most part, but they didn't keep it from going out into the world including Europe and ourselves. Trump's claim that China was to blame for the pandemic was coupled with the insistence that nothing would be done to stop the spread of the disease. No, we're not going to shut down, Trump insisted at the debate. While Biden said that any president who presided over 220,000 deaths did not deserve to remain in office, under Biden's own watch, a further 203,000 people have died. And the daily case rate has far exceeded what it was at the time of the debate, with the United States logging over 106 daily new cases or 106,000 daily new cases yesterday uh, in the third day uh, over the course of the past week in which cases have been higher than 100,000. Biden, like Trump, has sought to declare the pandemic over, discouraged mask wearing, and demanded the full reopening of businesses and schools. On May 13th, Biden said America was nearing the finish line of the pandemic. One month later, he said, America is headed into a summer dramatically different from last year's summer, a summer of freedom, a summer of joy, a summer of get togethers and celebrations, an all American summer that this country deserves after a long, long dark winter that we've all endured. Take your mask off, you've earned the right, Biden said. Now, just as Biden has embraced Trump's efforts to wish away COVID-19, to reopen schools and businesses no matter the cost and the policy of herd immunity, he has likewise accepted the corollary that Trump promoted, that China is to blame for the massive death toll that ensures from the ruling class's policies. Following the First World War, the question of war guilt dominated nearly every issue in global politics from the Versailles Treaty to the Ruhr Crisis of 1923 to the rise of the Nazis. Who bore responsibility for the 20 million who died in the First World War? The ruling class of every country sought to blame its rivals to distract attention from its own predatory war aims and from its own war profiteers. So too, the American ruling class seeks to project its own guilt for an act of mass social murder onto an external enemy. After the First World War, there was an element of truth to these accusations because all of the belligerents in the great imperialist war participated to secure their own predatory interests. Today, the claim that China is responsible for the pandemic is nothing but a shameless lie. This lecture will review the question, to borrow the title of Alexander Herzen's book, Who is to Blame? It will review the response to the pandemic both in China and the United States, the true story of the pandemic, and refute the myth of China's responsibility for the massive death toll in the United States, placing the blame where it belongs, squarely on the shoulders of American capitalism. Now, on January 20, 2020, the World Health Organization conducted a, sent a delegation uh, on a field visit to Wuhan at the height of the pandemic outbreak in Wuhan to learn about China's response to the pandemic. The findings explain how China was able able to largely contain and suppress the pandemic through a massive program of non-pharmaceutical interventions, contact tracing, testing, quarantine, the surging of medical uh, staff, 
Today, less than 4,600 people have died in China from the COVID-19 pandemic, less than the number of people who succumbed to COVID-19 on January 12th, 2021, in a single day. The World Health Organization wrote, in the face of a previously unknown virus, China has rolled out perhaps the most ambitious, agile, and aggressive disease containment effort in history. Achieving China's exceptional coverage with and adherence to these containment measures has only been possible due to the deep commitment of the Chinese people to collective action in the face of a common threat. At the individual level, the Chinese people have reacted to this outbreak with courage and conviction. They have accepted and adhered to the starkest of containment measures, whether the suppression of public gatherings, the month-long stay-at-home advisories, or prohibitions on travel. Throughout the intensive nine days of site visits across China and frank discussions at the level of community mobilizers and frontline healthcare providers to top scientists, governors, and mayors, the joint mission was struck by the sincerity and dedication that each brings to the COVID-19 response. China's bold approach to contain the rapid spread of the new respiratory pathogen has changed the course of a rapidly escalating and deadly pandemic. The decline in COVID-19 cases across China is very real. This is all quoting from the report. But it went on to warn, much of the global community is not yet ready in mindset and materially to implement the measures that have been employed to contain COVID-19 in China. These are the only measures that are currently proven to interrupt or minimize transmission chains in humans. Fundamental to these measures is extremely proactive surveillance to immediately detect cases, very rapid diagnosis and immediate case isolation, rigorous tracking to quarantine close contacts, and an exceptionally high degree of population understanding and acceptance of these measures. And that's the World Health Organization's uh, on, on the spot evaluation of the response in China. Now, to, to what is the response in the United States to the pandemic. On January 24th, the Senate Health Committee and Senate Foreign Relations Committee held a closed door briefing open to all senators on the COVID-19 outbreak. Committee staffers told the WSWS that no records were kept of the content or attendance of the meeting. However, media reports indicate that Senate Intelligence Committee Chairman Richard Burr and Senator Kelly Loeffler attended. Emerging from the meeting, Dr. Anthony Fauci told reporters, I don't think this is something the United States public should be worried or frightened about. He added, I think the, the risk is very low to the United States. Whatever was said in private at the hearing, Loeffler did not get the same message as Fauci communicated publicly. Beginning after the hearing, Loeffler began selling stock in the, in the first of 29 stock transactions lasting several weeks. While she dumped stocks that would go on to lose value, she purchased shares in the online meeting firm Citrix, which makes the go-to meeting and go-to webinar, whose business boomed during the pandemic. On February 27th, Burr, the chairman of the Intelligence Committee, secretly told a group of affluent Washington insiders at a private club known as the Tar Heel Circle, who paid as much as $10,000 per year for membership, that the pandemic would be much more severe than the public was being told. There's one thing I can tell you about this. It's much more aggressive in its transmission than anything that we have seen in recent history, he said, according to a secret reporting of his remarks obtained by NPR. It's probably more akin to the 1918 pandemic. These flat statements flatly contradicted the tone of a public op-ed that he wrote just three days earlier, earlier, in which he declared the United States was better prepared than ever before to respond to a pandemic. Burr would subsequently resign as chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee in response to the revelations and his, his uh, sale of stocks uh, based on the information that he received. Now, the Washington Post reported that lawmakers were repeatedly and extensively briefed about the danger posed by the pandemic throughout the first two months of the year. U.S. intelligence agencies were issuing ominous classified warnings in January and February about the global danger posed by the coronavirus, while President Trump and lawmakers played down the threat and failed to take action that might have sowed the spread of the pathogen. This is the Washington Post. The article continued, taken together, the reports and warnings painted an early picture of a virus that showed the characteristics of a globe encircling pandemic that could require governments to take swift, swift action to contain it. But despite the constant flow of reporting, Trump continued publicly and privately to play down the threat of 
uh, of the, that the virus posed down to Americans. Lawmakers, too, including the Democrats, did not grapple with the virus in, in earnest until the month of March. Now, this is, again, the Washington Post. Now, between January 31st and February 18th, Dianne Feinstein, the ranking Democrat on the Senate Intelligence Committee, sold between 1.5 million and 6 million worth of stock. On February 13th, Burr sold between 600,000 and $1.72 million worth of stock, unloading hotel chains, which would see their stock value plunge during the pandemic. Now, while the, the uh, senators were personally protecting their, their own financial interests and preparing for the massive bailout that was to come of Wall Street, uh, throughout the month of January, the, the number of new COVID-19 cases throughout China grew rapidly. In, fe in early February, U.S. President Donald Trump told Bob Woodward that he had a conversation with Chinese President Xi Jinping, who had provided the American president with a clear and blunt assessment of the dangers posed by the pandemic. This is deadly stuff, Trump said. This is more deadly than even your strenuous flus. This is 5% versus 1% and less than 1%, Trump said, comparing it to the flu. Eschewing the anti-scientific anti demagogy of his public statements, Trump demonstrated a clear and precise understanding of the disease in his discussion with Woodward. It goes through the air, Bob. It's always much tougher than touch, Trump said, an appraisal fully in line with the current scientific consensus. As demonstrated by Trump's description of his phone call with Xi, Chinese authorities were as transparent with the U.S. officials as they were with public, the public health community, precisely explaining the disease's method of transmission, its fatality rate, and the measures necessary to contain it. Now, we now know that there was widespread community transmission occurring through the United States throughout early January. But despite the availability of a COVID-19 test from the World Health Organization, no tests were conducted in the U.S. during the entire month of January and almost all of February. The decision not to test the population in the first two months of the pandemic has never been convincingly explained from, from uh, within the U.S. government. The WHO formally alerted the world to the outbreak that began on January 1st. As the Financial Times noted, Jared Kushner, who, organizes the, who organized the White House's pandemic response behind the scenes, quote, had been arguing that testing too many people or ordering too many ventilators could spook the markets and we just shouldn't do it. And of course, pointing to the low number of officially recognized cases, Trump administration officials claimed that the danger was low while discouraging the public from taking vital social distancing measures that are, could have called to the spread of the pandemic. Now, that's the response of the ruling class. All of them, from the Democrats to the, to the White House, did nothing. And the media did nothing to warn the public about the impending danger. By contrast, the World Socialist website was issuing the starkest warnings. We wrote on February 28th, the International Committee of the Fourth International calls for a globally coordinated emergency response to the spreading coronavirus pandemic. The working class must demand that governments make available the resources required to contain the spread of the disease, treat and care for those who are infected, and secure the livelihoods of hundreds of millions of people who will be affected by the economic fallout. Now, throughout the month of January and February, leading figures within the Democratic Party observed an airtight silence on the pandemic. This was in line with the posture of the New York Times, which did not write a single editorial on the subject between January 29th and February 29th. But by mid-March, the pandemic was totally overwhelming Italy and rapidly spreading on New York. It became impossible to keep up the charade. Once the U.S. finally began testing people who showed symptoms of COVID-19, it became undeniable that there was massive and widespread community transmission all over the country that had been going on at this point for months. Now, on March 19th, Trump told journalist Bob Woodward that he was deliberately misleading the American public about the danger. Trump said, I always wanted to play it down. I still like playing it down because I don't want to create a panic. Now, on March 14th, the Socialist Equality Party published a statement titled Shut Down the Auto Plants and Halt the Spread of the Coronavirus, which circulated widely inside the auto plants of the American Midwest. Over the following week, a series of wildcat strikes forced the shutdown of the entire U.S. auto industry, with Fiat Chrysler announcing the end of production on March 18th. 
Trump's interview with Woodward occurred the next day as the markets were near their lows for the year after the Dow Jones Industrial Average had dropped close to 10,000 points. On March 25th, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell announced an agreement on the CARES Act. The Senate unanimously passed the bill that evening and the House followed with an unrecorded voice vote. The bill was signed by Trump within just five days of the first uh, procedural vote. Now, the CARES Act funneled trillions of dollars to major corporations, accompanying something like $4 trillion in additional interventions by the, the Federal Reserve. The total interventions with the passage of the CARES Act in propping up the financial markets and bailing out major corporations, the Trump administration said, was something in the tune of $6 trillion that had been conjured up overnight uh, to rescue the financial markets. But as soon as this piece, critical piece of legislation uh, was signed into law, as soon as the, the markets started to rise, uh, the, and in fact, the same day as the, the first vote on the CARES Act, New York Times columnist Thomas Friedman published, quote, a plan to get America back to work, arguing for letting the virus run rampant throughout the population and a policy of herd immunity. Within a matter of days, Trump began to advocate for the abandonment of basic measures under the slogan coined by the New York Times' Thomas Friedman that the cure can't be worse than disease. The campaign led the White House to release a set of guidelines entitled Opening Up America Again. While these guidelines nominally set out a set of criteria for states to reopen non-essential businesses, they in fact sent a political signal that all measures to contain the disease to, were to be abandoned. Governors in every state proceeded to reopen, even in violation of the Trump administration's own guidelines, including states with Democratic uh, governors, in addition to Republican governors, uh, where cases continued to surge. The states, Deborah Burke said, the, the White House uh, coronavirus advisor, went on to completely ignore the opening criteria. She added, I didn't see coming that no one would follow the gating criteria. So when Memorial Day came, it was shocking. Well, the state's actions did not come as a surprise for the World Socialist website. Just days after the release of the guidelines, probably the 24 hours or 48 hours, uh, we wrote, the Trump administration's cynical announcement of a set of fraudulent guidelines will serve to legitimize a rapid reopening of businesses and a forced return to work in unsafe conditions, bringing an end to any public pretense of a systematic and coordinated effort within the United States to prioritize health and protect human life in combating the spread of the COVID-19 pandemic. One year later, or over one year later, not a word of this analysis needs to be changed. With an announcement of the reopening criteria, Burks and Fauci were totally sidelined, going weeks without speaking to Trump, replaced with a right-wing ideologue and herd immunity proponent, Scott Atlas. As testing czar Brett P. Girard, uh put it, Scott Atlas's position is that we should just sort of let it go in the healthy population to create herd immunity. Atlas and his co-thinkers believed that any measures to contain the disease were compromising the American economy, the American lifestyle. In their minds, all these things outweighed the fatalities. Or as one White House staffer subsequently put it, we want them infected. Now, in an interview with CNN, Deborah Burks admitted that nearly half a million deaths in the United States were preventable. As Burks put it, the first time we have an excuse. There were about 100,000 deaths that came from the original surge. The rest of them, in my mind, could have been mitigated or decreased significantly. I think that is a, a, a damning indictment from, from within uh, the, the White House that, that coordinated this utterly uh, criminal response. Now, what was Biden's response to the pandemic? Now, the, for months after, after taking office, Biden has used the claim that vaccinated people are fully protected from COVID-19 to justify the abandonment of masking and social distancing. Despite that the CDC, fact the CDC had access to data definitively proving the opposite. Take your mask off, you've earned the right, Biden said in June. On May 13th, the CDC reversed its guidance on mask wearing, urging vaccinated people to stop wearing masks and socially distancing in crowded areas. Anyone who is fully vaccinated can participate in indoor and outdoor activities, large and small, without wearing a mask or physical distancing, said CDC Director Rochelle Walensky. 
The CDC's statements prompted a near total abandonment of mask wearing in the United States. Within days, businesses stopped enforcing mask mandates, while the vaccinated public, misinformed by the CDC, went maskless in public and re reduced social distancing. At the same time, the CDC stopped monitoring breakthrough infections among vaccinated people in an action that epidemiologist Eric Feigl Ding, uh, call, who we'll be hearing from later today, uh, called n neglectful and derelict in their duty. The deliberate promotion of this false advice by health authorities helped drive the massive resurgence of the pandemic uh, we have now seen, in which cases have increased something close to seven or eightfold, are now surging uh, by, you know, daily new cases, they're surging by five to 10,000 every single day. Hospitalization in Florida uh, is now at the highest rate ever. And in fact, multiple health, health authorities are warning that the absolutely the darkest days of the pandemic are in front of us unless action is taken immediately. Now, in February of this year, the British Medical Journal, or the BMJ, formerly known as the British Medical Journal, published an editorial accusing the world's governments of social murder in their collective response to the pandemic. Murder, the editorial begins, is an emotive word in law, it requires premeditation. Death must be, must be deemed to be unlawful. How could murder apply to failures of a pandemic response? The BMJ then goes on to argue that the term is entirely appropriate. When politicians and experts say they are willing to allow tens of thousands of premature deaths for the sake of population immunity or in the hope of propping up the economy, is that not premeditated and reckless indifference to human life? If policy failures lead to recurrent and mistimed lockdowns, who is responsible for the resulting non-COVID excess deaths? When politicians willfully neglect scientific advice, international and historical experience, and their own alarming statistics and modeling because an act goes against their political strategy, is that lawful? Is inaction action? At the very least, the BMJ writes, COVID-19 might be classified as social murder pointing to the use of the term by the socialist leader, Frederick Engels, in describing the political and social power held by the ruling elite over the working classes in 19th century England. Now that is the reality of the pandemic and the responsibility of, of the ruling class as, as the, the British Medical Journal, BMJ calls it, for social murder. And the acuteness of this enormous crime against the population it is what compels the falsification of the history of the pandemic. The attempt to claim that responsibility is not to be placed on American capitalism and the American ruling elite and the, the government that represents it, but on China. So now let's, let's explore the, the origins of the Wuhan lab lie. The Wuhan lab conspiracy theory was originated in January 2020 by the fascist Steve Bannon and his allies among the right wing Chinese expatriates, such as Miles Guo, who claimed in the words of Trump advisor Peter Navarro that COVID-19 was a weaponized virus. In mid January 2020, US based Chinese dissident Wang Dingang, who broadcasts in Mandarin as Luda, appears to have originated the claim that COVID-19 had, quote, been deliberately released by the Chinese Communist Party. Wang Dingang is, is an associate of Bannon, Miles Guo, and former New York City Mayor Rudy Giuliani. Here you see, uh, uh, in, in that image, you see uh, um, uh, Wang with uh, Giuliani, and in the background, you, you see uh, Steve Bannon in the shadows right behind uh, Giuliani, and it's an appropriate picture. G News, uh, on, on January 25th, G News, uh, the site operated by Miles Guo, the business partner of Bannon, published an article asserting that the real source of the coronavirus is from a lab in Wuha linked with con covert biological weapons program. By all indications, the first post was the first categorical assertion of this claim available in English. The same day, on January 25th, Steve Bannon launched the war room pandemic, which would become a, core, a cornerstone of the fascist movement around former President Donald Trump. In the first episode of the podcast, taped on January 25th, Bannon interviewed Washington Times columnist Bill Gertz to speak on the Wuhan lab theory. 
Bannon asks him, Bill, could you briefly summarize the article you did yesterday, implying that Bannon had advanced knowledge of Gertz's article two days before it was published? On January 31st, the far-right Epoch Times, associated with the Falun Gong New Religious Movement, published an article entitled, Did China's Plan to Destroy the United States Backfire? The article declares that the rule, ruling Chinese Communist Party considers biological weapons to be the most important weapon for accomplishing their goal of cleaning up America. It concludes, it's highly probable that the uh, 2019 NCOV organism was a weaponized form of NCOV discovered by Saudi Arabia, uh, by Sa Saudi doctors in 2012. Now, from, from these sewers, uh, this was dredged up uh, and, and washed up in the White House with uh, on uh, Secretary of State Mon Mike Pompeo declaring on May 3rd that there is enormous evidence that the virus originated in a Wuhan laboratory, adding, remember, China has a history of infecting the world. In a separate interview the same day, White House uh, advisor Peter Navarro declared that China seeded the world with what became the pandemic, calling it a weaponized virus. From here, uh, originating in uh, around uh, uh, the, the fascist circles around Bannon, uh, making its way throughout the White House and becoming official policy, uh, it, the lie was then laundered through uh, the so-called mainstream press. On April 14th, Washington Post columnist Josh Rogan published an op-ed giving the newspaper's imprimatur to the Trump administration's false claims that COVID-19 emerged from a laboratory. Up to that point dismissed as a right-wing conspiracy theory, Rogan's piece established the Wuhan lab lie as part of the official political discourse in the United States. Under the headline, State Department cables warned of safety issues at Wuhan labs studying bat coronaviruses, Rogan wrote, one senior administration official told me that the cables prove w one more piece of evidence to support the possibility that the pandemic is a result of a lab accident in Wuhan. Tellingly, when the full diplomatic cable referenced by Rogan was released in July, the Washington Post itself concluded in a separate article, this wasn't in a, in a correction or anything that they pub published on Rogan's article, they wrote, the full cable does not strengthen the claim that an accident at the lab caused the virus to escape. Any of the reading... Any reading of the cable makes clear that is nothing like Rogan's interpretation. On May 5th, the theory was revised and given a pseudoscientific presentation by Nicholas Wade, in, who in an article published in the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, presented a narrative in which the U.S. and Chinese scientists created SARS-CoV-2 through gain-of-function experiments at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Wade's narrative was embraced by the New York Times, Washington Post, and Wall Street Journal, all of which published editorials or major op-eds citing Wade without examining his background. According to Wade, leading U.S., Chinese, and other international scientists secretly collaborated on gain-of-function research, released the, the virus, then covered up the incident so effectively that no evidence of the conspiracy can be found to this day. Of course, uh, the World Socialist website uh, would, would later report uh, that uh, Wade is a well-known serial falsifier and proponent of, of racist ideology. But we'll return to that. Then on May 23rd, the Wall Street Journal published an article titled Intelligence on Six Staff at Wuhan Lab Fuels Debate on COVID-19 Origin. Citing unnamed current and former officials, it claimed that researchers at the Wuhan Institute of Virology went to hospital in November 2019, shortly before a confirmed outbreak of COVID-19. Then on May 25th, the Washington Post published a fact checker column by Glenn Kessler, headlined how the Wuhan lab leak theory suddenly became credible, aimed at presenting the US media's embrace of a right-wing conspiracy theory as reasonable and logical. Then within days, uh, on May 26, US President Joe Biden called on the intelligence community to investigate whether COVID-19 arose from a laboratory accident and to report back to me within 90 days. Now, it is worth noteworthy that the leading advocate of the Wuhan lab theory, uh, in, at least in its, its current in, incarnation promoted by uh, newspapers such as the Washington Post, is Nicholas Waite. Uh, he is a well-known serial fabricator uh, among his notable lines are that that Jews are biologically adapted to capitalism. 
He is a promoter of racist pseudoscience embraced by figures uh, such as uh, uh, the, the neo-fascist Nick Fuentes uh, and the former KKK grand wizard David Duke. But there is a profoundly uh, disturbing racist undercurrent uh, in this accusation. As Kevin Komashiro, PhD, the former dean of the University of San Francisco School of Education wrote, associating disease with a particular country or race has serious consequences. From the early 1800s through the 1900s, Chinese and at times Japanese immigrants to the U.S. were accused of bringing and spreading bubonic plague, cholera, smallpox, syphilis, trachoma, and even sexual deviance. The results of such beliefs were school segregation, systematic destruction of homes and property, and immigration restrictions. Now, he writes, fear of the yellow peril has taken shape in the form of allegations that China is engaged in germ warfare by intentionally spreading COVID-19 to weaken the economies of other nations, particularly the U.S. Attacking people, attacking China and people of Asian descent by conjuring up long histories of racialized disease serves effectively to detract attention from the failures of the Trump administration in addressing the current pandemic. Now, the demonization of uh, Chinese and Asian Americans uh, throughout the United States uh, by the media uh, over and, and by Trump uh, over the alleged responsibility for the COVID-19 pandemic has uh, prompted uh, a discernible wave of violence against Asian Americans. On March 11th, the House Judiciary Committee held a hearing on discrimination of violence against Asian Americans, which noted that 80% of Asian Americans said violence against them was rising. One third feared someone might threaten to physically attack them. One quarter were subjected to racial slurs or jokes, and one in six were told that they should either go back to their home country or were to blame for the pandemic. The opening statement to the hearing by the ranking Republican on the committee, Texas Representative Chip Roy, was a racist diatribe and open incitement to violence. Referring to the Chinese as chai comms, a racist slur, Roy declared, I think they're the bad guys. He added, that's the reality of what I tend to refer to as the chai comms. And I'm not going to be ashamed of saying I oppose chai comms. He favorably invoked the legacy of lynch law in America, declaring, there is an old saying in Texas about find all the rope in Texas and get a tall oak tree. Last month, Fascist Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene openly called for ethnic ethnic cleansing, declaring, I would kick out every single Chinese in this country that is loyal to the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party. They would be gone. I do not care who they are. Now, no one should believe that uh, the racist components of the the anti-China campaign are confined to the Republicans. In September 2019, The Washington Post published an editorial that endorsed a report by the Hoover Institution uh, calling for the exclusion of Chinese students and professors. The Hoover Institution report wrote, officials from Beijing have stated clearly that they do not view overseas Chinese as simply citizens of foreign countries, but rather as overseas compatriots who have both historical connections and responsibilities as, quote, sons and daughters of the Yellow Emperor, end quote. And this garbage is, is endorsed uh, by by uh, the Washington Post, owned by Jeff Bezos, and with its slogan, democracy dies in darkness. Now, the, the lie uh, that China is responsible for, for the pandemic, and particularly a, in its incarnation as, as the, the claim that COVID-19 originated uh, at the Wuhan Institute of Virology, flies in the face of everything that is known about the origins of COVID-19. Dan Simorowski, a biochemist and senior editor of Massive Science, presented the issue as follows. Comparing the two hypotheses of natural origin versus the lab leak theory. He writes, one hypothesis requires a colossal cover-up in the silent, unswerving, leak-proof compliance of a vast network of scientists, civilians, and government officials for over a year. The other requires only biology to behave as it always has for a family of viruses that have done this before to do it again. The zoonomic spillover hypothesis is simple and explains everything. It's scientific malpractice to pretend that one idea is equally as meritorious as the other. The lab leak hypothesis is a scientific deus ex ex machina, a narrative shortcut that points the finger at a specific set of bad actors. 
But to date, the most succinct response to the narrative pro- promoted by Nicholas Wade uh, and his defenders in the in the Washington Post, New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, etc., uh, is a paper published by Edward Holmes of the University of Sydney and Professor uh, Andrew Rimbaud of the University of Edinburgh. Among the co-authors are Georgetown University virologist Angela Rasmussen and Christian G. Anderson, director of the Infectious Disease Genomics at the Scripps Research Translational Institute. The paper begins by noting that the transfer of animal diseases to humans has been definitively shown to have caused nearly all previous pandemics. It writes, SARS-CoV-2 is the ninth documented coronavirus that infects humans and the seventh identified in the last 20 years, it states. All previous human coronaviruses have zoonomic origins, as have the vast majority of human virus. Uh, The paper adds, the emergence of SARS-CoV-2 bears several signatures of prior zoonomic events. It displays clear similarities to SARS-CoV, that is the SARS virus, that spilled over in humans in Foshang, Guangdong province, China, on November 2002, and again in Guangzhou, Guangdong province in 2003. Our careful and critical analysis of the currently available data proved no evidence for the idea that SARS-CoV-2 originated in a laboratory, Holmes said. Rather, the scientists argue there is a substantial body of scientific evidence supporting a zoonomic origins for COVID, SARS-CoV-2. There is no evidence that any early cases had any connection to the Wuhan Institute of Virology, in contrast to their clear epidemiological links to animal markets in Wuhan, nor evidence that the Wuhan Institute of Virology possessed or worked on a progenitor of SARS-CoV-2 prior to the pandemic. The authors further note that the SARS-CoV-2 virus does not resemble any virus that could theoretically be used as a backbone to create a new virus. The paper adds, under any laboratory escape scenario, SARS-CoV-2 would have have to been present in a laboratory prior to the pandemic, yet no evidence exists to support such a notion, and no sequence has been identified that it could could have served as a precursor. The scientists note that while gain of function research is typically carried out in laboratory mice, the virus was not well adapted to rodents, indicating that SARS-CoV-2 is highly unlikely to have been acquired by laboratory workers in the course of viral pathogenesis through gain of function experiments. And critically, and I think given, given the emergence of the Delta variant, uh, with its uh, uh, increased transmissibility, viral load, and, and immense danger, particularly to younger people, uh, this passage is, is particularly significant. The paper adds that since its emergence, SARS-CoV-2 has experienced repeated sweeps of mutations that have increased viral fitness, refuting the claim that COVID-19 is somehow originally optimized to infect humans. Combined, these findings show that no specific human pre-adaptation was required for the emergence or early spread of SARS-CoV-2, and the claim that the virus was already highly adapted to the human host is without validity. These uh, statements continue and emphasize the findings of the World Health Organization's report on the origins of COVID-19, which dismissed the the possibility of a lab leak as extremely unlikely uh, and completely ruled out uh, the the deliberate development of COVID-19 as a biological weapon. Now, uh, the, a leading role in exposing the pseudoscience promoted by, by Wade and other advocates of the lab leak theory uh, was played by uh, scientists including Peter Daszak and Ralph Barak uh, with the World Health Organization team and other scientists including Christian G. Anderson and Al- Angela Rasmussen. Um, while the, these scientists have played a leading role in, in exposing and debunking the science, uh, the World Socialist website has uh, played a critical role in exposing the lies presented in the major U.S. media outlets to promote this lie. And uh, the World Socialist website has been recognized for its contributions by many of these leading scientists, including uh, Peter Daszak. The World Socialist website was the only publication that exposed the role of Stephen Bannon and Miles Guo following the Washington Post's declaration that the lab leak theory is credible. Uh, Peter Daszak, the leading target of the Wuhan lab conspiracy theory, thanked the WSWS for its coverage of the issue. When Daszak came under attack uh, for his statement of support, he declared, the last time I checked, we've moved beyond McCarthy in the U.S. I think a a very principled statement. While the entire presentation of of, uh, the Wuhan lab uh, theory 
is entirely uncritical of Nicholas Wade in the official media. Uh, the WSWS has exposed the role of Wade as a serial falsifier and racist ideologue. Since the publication of our article pointing to uh, his numerous falsifications of, of science and promotion of race, racist pseudoscience, uh, Wade has not been cited a single time by the New York Times, Washington Post, or Wall Street Journal. The World Socialist website further exposed the fact that Michael Gordon was the co-author with Jude, Judith Miller of the article claiming that Saddam Hussein was seeking to obtain aluminum tubes for creating weapons of mass destruction. Our article was shared by Dazak, as well as reporters from Nature News, Forbes, the Sydney Morning Herald, The Wire, and over a dozen, dozen other news articles. It was tweeted by China's Deputy Minister of Propaganda, the de Deputy Director of Ch the Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs Information Department, and the former head of the Foreign Affairs Committee in the Russian State Duma. This is how, how carefully uh, the coverage of the World Socialist website is, is being followed in official circles. Our refutation of the Wuhan lab lie was also cited extensively in the uh, official Chinese Xinhua news agency, uh, which had a two paragraph quote uh, of the World Socialist website saying, more than one year into the pandemic, these baseless theories are propounded throughout the corporate press as part of a coordinated international campaign to deflect the burden of blame for the pandemic from the ruling elite's disastrous response against the contagion and thrust it ahead on the heads of the Chinese government and Chinese scientists. Now, as the World Socialist website was exposing these deliberate falsifications of science, uh, the deliberate promotion of pseudoscience, it was the target of a, a very significant campaign of, of censorship. And in fact, one of the most heavy handed acts of censorship against the World Socialist website uh, in its history uh, took place directly uh, in, in relation to this event. On February 25th, uh, 2021, Facebook blocked its users from sharing the WSWS perspective, World Washington Post's Wuhan lab conspiracy theory stands exposed. Facebook blocked anyone from sharing the WSWS article, claiming that it goes against our community standards and declaring that the article included false information that has been repeatedly debunked. Multiple writers and readers for the World Socialist website either received warnings or had their accounts suspended for sharing the article. Then on May 1st, uh, suddenly, Facebook notified users that the World Socialist website uh, article had been inappropriately censored, apologized for its action, but gave no serious explanation. And of course, the World Socialist website remained censored on Reddit's coronavirus forum, as well as World News and the politics section. And Google, of course, continues its, its uh, continued intervention to bury the World Socialist website uh, in search results. Now, the entirety of the middle class uh, left or pseudo left was silent on the World Socialist website's censorship by Facebook over its refutation of the Wuhan lab lie. But with the publication of Gordon's article in the Wall Street Journal, significant sections of the middle class left move openly to embrace the lie. The most prominent advocate of this conspiracy theory among figures previously associated with the left was Glenn Greenwald, who worked to obscure the parallels between the Wuhan lab lie and the Bush administration's lies about weapons of mass destruction. He wrote, there seems to be a fear, especially on the left, that the lab leak theory is militaristic or anti-China. Not true for several reasons. The US funded joint research in Wuhan and truth is truth. Sorry about that. Uh, and uh, truth is truth, Greenwald said. Jacobin writer Branko Marcidic demanded that this conspiracy theory be treated as legitimate. The dismissal of calls to take the lab leak theory seriously on the basis that it's a U.S. government conspiracy to undermine China doesn't make much sense. Also not convinced by the theory being true would be like Iraqi WMDs. And of course, Greenwald and Marcita were joined by John Stewart, who claimed that the pandemic was caused by science and caused by China. As we uh, commented at the time, Marxists have long pointed to the phenomenon of the enraged petty bourgeois who can, in certain historical periods, swing violently and sharply to the right. Now, Stuart, Marr, and Greenwald, and the social air they speak for, have been swept up by powerful right-wing currents in contemporary politics, unmoored by vast social crisis all around them, which they do not understand, and for which they are politically unprepared. Now, in conclusion, the promotion of this unsubstantiated theory and false theory 
by this by the U.S. media can only be explained on the basis of the socioeconomic interests driving it. As the World Socialist Website International Editorial Board wrote in its May 28th statement, the aims of this, this uh, lie are to divert attention from the actions of the U.S. and other governments in implementing policies that led to deaths on a massive scale. As the public begins to recover from the overwhelming shock of the pandemic, there will be demands for explanations for why so many people died along with accountability for those responsible. The campaign is aimed at threatening, bullying, and intimidating scientists into keeping silent as the United States abandons all the measures necessary to contain the pandemic, even as cases surge to record levels. To the extent that Fauci and other scientists are criticized, have criticized the removal of restrictions or made warnings about the extreme danger of the pandemic, they have become a central target of the fascistic right. Second, the Wuhan lab lie seeks to drum up nationalist hatred to support the Biden administration's central strategic aim, the preparation of economic and potentially military conflict with China. Now, a sobering warning in this effect. In November, Bloomberg made the final following assessment about the danger of a U.S.-China conflict. There is one factor that people are loath to discuss with one exception. Yes, the U.S. has botched its response to COVID-19. At the same time, its experience shows that America as a nation can in fact tolerate casualties, too many in fact. It has long been a standard doctrine that Americans are soft and unwilling to take on much risk. If you were a Chinese war game planner, might you now reconsider that assumption? I, I, I think a really truly horrifying uh, and, and sickening quote that, that American society and American capitalism is, a, is prepared to throw away lives in the hundreds of thousands. This is a portrait of a utterly sick social order. Consciously and knowingly, the political representatives of the American financial oligarchy have taken actions that have led to the deaths of over 600,000 people in America. A ruling class capable of such actions is capable of any crime. We must call things by their real name. The Biden administration, like the Trump administration, is pursuing a policy of herd immunity through mass infection. And this is the policy that has been correctly termed by the BMJ as social murder. The proverbial vexed questions of Russian history and literature are what is to be done, referring to Herzen's novel. I'm sorry, who is to blame, referring to the title of Herzen's novel, and what is to be done, referring to the title of the works by Chernyshevsky and Lenin. In the pandemic, as with all great historical questions, the, the two issues are intimately linked. He who says that China is to blame for the pandemic absolves American capitalism of its crimes, both past and future. The advocates of the Wuhan lab lie are the advocates of herd immunity and learning to live with the virus. A year and a half into a pandemic that only goes from bad to worse, it's possible to draw certain definite and concrete conclusions. The Biden administration is, is carrying out a policy of social murder. And who is to blame? Ultimately, it is capitalism. What is to be done? Capitalism must be abolished. The conclusions are the ones that we drew in our first IC statement on the pandemic no more than a year and a half ago. The present crisis demonstrates again that capitalism is an outmoded economic system and barrier to human progress. The danger posed by this pandemic and the catastrophic implications of global warming prove that the capitalist system must give way to world socialism. I think more and more now the, the question becomes, what is to be done? How is the working class to intervene in this immense crisis, which cries out for a socialist political solution? And I think that the events of these past two years have confirmed the theory of the fifth stage in the history of the International Committee. Ultimately, this crisis will not be, this crisis is not a medical issue and will not be resolved outside of the intervention by the working class in the political crisis. And it's this intervention that we are now politically preparing.